Good morning, Cornerstone family. We're so glad you're joining us for Church Online. Whether you're tuning in from out of town, in the car, or from your home in the Kansas City area, we're so glad you're joining us in worship. Thank you for bringing the church online. I'm excited to share a few announcements with you this morning. To help plan for our upcoming Hunt a Trunk event, our March mission focus will be plastic Easter eggs and wrapped bite-sized candy. Our goal is to collect 3,000 eggs and 13,000 candies. Place your donations in the mission bin by Wednesday, March 20th. If you're looking to take our March mission focus one step further, join us at our church-wide egg stuffing party on Saturday, March 16th from 10 a.m. to noon. RSVP online at cornerstoneks.org slash party. Our next fellowship dinner is coming up. We'll gather at Chicken and Pickle this Thursday, March 14th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. This event is a great way to meet new people and share a meal together. Information can be found at cornerstoneks.org slash fellowship. We hope to see you there. Like I mentioned before, our annual Easter Hunt a Trunk event is coming up on Saturday, March 23rd from 2 to 3.30 p.m. We'll have an inflatable obstacle course, an exotic animal petting zoo, rows of decorated car trunks filled with candy, eggs, face painting, and even a visit from Slugger. To make this event a success, we need your help. Sign up to decorate a trunk, serve snacks, help with parking, and more at cornerstoneks.org slash hunt a trunk. As always, these announcements and other resources can be found by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing here at Cornerstone. Good morning, church. Join me this morning for our call to worship out of Psalms 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog. He set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who put their trust in the Lord. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning together.
Well, each week our time of confession is an opportunity for us to hear the good news of the gospel, to be reminded of our sinfulness and our need for Jesus, and then to hear what God has provided in the provision of Christ. So let's recite this together with great anticipation of knowing that God has provided everything necessary for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's join together. Most gracious Father, we acknowledge and confess that we are prone to evil and lazy in doing good. All our shortcomings and offenses are against you, and you alone know how often we have sinned by wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, and in forgetting your love. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Teach us to hate our sins and cleanse us from our secret faults. Forgive all our sins on account of your dear Son, our Savior. Send your purifying grace into the, our hearts, that we might live in your light and walk according to the commandments of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So here's the hope that we get to hold on to from Micah chapter 7. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy, and you will again have compassion on us, and you will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And that's exactly what Christ did for us, that when he nailed our sin to the cross, the Lord no longer counts those sins against us. Instead, he sees us clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's the beauty of the gospel. May that give you hope this morning. Well, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Great and mighty God, we thank you for your love and mercy shown toward us. In the giving of your Son, you have shown how much love you have for this world and for us. We are so grateful that you would not leave us or forsake us and abandon your people, but instead you have rescued your people through the giving of your Son because of the sinfulness that was within our heart. So, Lord, we thank you that our sins have found a remedy in Jesus. And that with each spike that went into his hands and feet, you nailed the sins of the world to the cross. And Jesus made atonement for them. He covered over our sin through his body and blood that would be shed there so that we would be made right with you, enabling us now to boldly come into the presence of your kingdom, in the, your presence, into your throne room, and be able to boldly bring prayers before you and speak and commune with you. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful gift of fellowship that we now have with you. So, Lord, we pray today that we would become the people that you want us to be, that we would learn how to become servants, to be more and more like Jesus, and to live according to the ways of the cross instead of the ways of the world. So, Father, we do pray that your Spirit would enable us to be servants, to be more and more people that serve others and care for those and the needs of others around us. Teach us to abandon our selfish ambition and now help us to be seeing others as more significant than ourselves, as your scriptures tell us. We thank you that this is exactly what Jesus has done for us. He came and he died on the cross for us. He humbled himself. He became a servant, a servant to the many that he would come and ransom. For your scriptures remind us that he came to serve, not to be served. And he came to give his life as a ransom for many. We thank you, Lord, that he paid our price. He paid the price for our selfish ambition. He paid the price for the sinfulness within our heart. And so with that, we are grateful that Jesus was truly our remedy. Teach us to adore him all the more and teach us to live like him throughout the day. Father, that the people would see through our hands and feet the beauty of Christ's gospel working in our hearts. Help us to care for our neighbor, to love you with all of our heart. For this is the essence of your commandments that you've given to us. We pray that your spirit would empower us to live this life. We thank you that we can't gain this on our own, but you sent your son and you've given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to do the very things that you call us to do. So use us to be your church and to be your people in this world. So all the world who are far from Jesus would come near to Jesus because of what they see in us and what they hear in the good news of the gospel. Father, we want to be that kind of church in this community. We want to be that kind of people. So work in us in the hearing of your word this morning to be perfected, to be made more and more like Christ. For your glory's sake, we pray, just as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We've called this series Contagious Faith because we're building it off the book by Mark Middleberg. We'd love for you to maybe pick one up in the lobby. We have a few of those there. I believe they're on the back table today. I can't remember what the price is, but we'd love for you, if you don't have one, uh, to be able to get a copy today. Because we want to learn about what kind of style we have been given by God in order to share Christ with other people. We want to learn how to be effective in doing so. And so last week I was reading an article about a cruise ship, and you're well aware of many of the problems that cruise ships are having these days with the way that infectious diseases can spread on them. And I read an article about a a cruise ship that had 3,000 people on it, and they had stopped in a port, and someone got sick, and then many on the ship were sick. They weren't able to stop in any port because the disease was cholera. They stopped in a port in Africa, and then it spread like wildfire on the ship. And in the past year, 188,000 people have gotten cholera because of how infectious it is. Now, we want to use that illustration to remind us that that's exactly what God does with his church. He makes us to be a contagious church, a contagious and infectious people, that we share our faith with others, and it blossoms and blooms and Jesus told the parable about the mustard seed and he said my kingdom is like that it's very small but it's going to expand to great size and we look at the kingdom of God today and we see that billions of people have come to Christ because people shared it with one another they were infectious with their faith and that's why some of you are sitting here today because someone in your past, maybe in your family's past, maybe with your parents or somebody else, but you're sitting here today because someone was bold enough to share Christ with you and you became a follower of Jesus. And God desires us to continue that work, to continue on that mission, to tell others about him. Because we learned last week that Jesus came into this world to seek and to save the lost. That was his mission. It tells us what kind of God we have. We have a a missionary God that wants us to go and tell, and he sends us there in Matthew chapter 28. We read it last week to be reminded that we are a people that are to go and make disciples. It's the mission of Cornerstone. It's the mission of every church. And what's fascinating is that God chose you for that very work, and God prepares you for that very work. He partners with you in that work, and he unleashes you to go do that work. He'll give you everything necessary for you to be effective. So we want to take the opportunity to look at these different faith styles to learn what works within us, the way that the Lord has made you, the way the Lord has wired you, so that you would understand the the effective means that you would be able to be used by God to reach others that are far from the Lord. Now, I want you to understand we're going to go through these five different faith styles, but you need to understand that sometimes you're a mixture of these. Sometimes you're the other, the opposite of what you are because the Lord empowers us to do all of these things. We learned about friendship building last week. That was the first one. And this week, we're going to look at the next one, which is selfless serving. Selfless serving is a way that the Lord will use us in this world by taking care of the needs of people. And it will open up a door for you to hopefully have a conversation with God's people, the people that he brings across your path, so that you would be able to show by your hands and your feet the way 
that Jesus did, that you are authenticating his message when he sees or he uses you to do that work in this world. And by the simple act of serving somebody else, you make Jesus visible. So God's mission is for every one of us to be actively involved in sharing Jesus with the world. And this selfless serving approach is sharing your faith with the needs of others, and that becomes the main way that you may do so. It might be helping them with something at their home. It might be taking care of some of the needs that they have. It might be driving your neighbor to the doctor's office because their car is broken down. And who knows what the Lord will give you an opportunity to do, but you then have the opportunity to build a bridge and build a relationship with others. And that you then have the opportunity to vocally share what has happened in you, the change that's happened in your life. Mark Middleberg said it this way, the selfless serving style often reaches the hardest to reach people, those who may not be open at this point to a friendship or a spiritual conversation. Because you're going to meet people like that that don't want to hear the message that you have. But the Lord might use a simple act of service to break down the barrier that someone might have toward God. When we sacrificially help them with their needs, this kind of Christ-like service can soften the hardest of hearts and even the most closed of minds. This week I was downtown at the City Union Mission for a gathering of pastors and they brought a man in who one year ago was living in the woods for the past five years. He had lost trust in people. He had lost trust in society. And he wanted to be in control of things. And so the best way to do that was to dictate where he would live and how he would live his life. And you might have said that he was there because of poor choices or the things like that. But we need to understand that there's things behind what caused people to be homeless. And it's not just the bad choices that you might think that they've made. There might be something in their past that is an enormous problem for them that causes them to end up being in this kind of situation. And because City Union Mission finds that their mission is to serve others and especially to serve those who are homeless, someone went out to that encampment and spent time helping him. And it began by doing little acts of service, bringing some food, bringing some water, and they were able to build a relationship with this man. And over several months, they invited him to come to the shelter. There to be able to find a place when it was cold, where it was very desperate in the middle of 16 degree weather that we hate. But he was able to come and find people who were serving him and wanted to help him in his time of need. And they invited him in, and then they invited him to some classes to help him get on his feet again. And then they began to share Jesus with him. And this past Tuesday morning, I was able to hear his testimony. And he showed a video where he took us back to his encampment and showed us, this is where I live for five years. And it was in the midst of brush, in the midst of debris, And now he has a job, which City Union Mission enabled him to have and helped him get it, helped prepare him to be able to do the interview, to be able to get the job, to get him on his feet. And now he is housing. And now today he serves at City Union Mission to help others that are homeless. And he goes out to other encampments and he said, look, I was right there. I know exactly what you've been through. But look at what happened to me. And it was all because of Selfless serving, of people giving up of their time and patience and the hard work of building a relationship in hard situations. And that becomes a story for us to be inspired and encouraged by. But today I want to take you into a passage. I want you to jump into a passage that teaches us the beauty of selfless service. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to turn to Mark chapter 10. It's found in verse 35. You're probably familiar with this passage and with this story. 
It goes like this. And James and John, who were some of the apostles, they were the sons of Zebedee. That was their father who came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now, that's a pretty bold statement to ask Jesus, don't you think? And you begin to sort of see what's in the heart of these two disciples. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And that cup is a reference to the wrath of God that Jesus would bear on the cross. And or are you to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And the word baptism there is representing the great flood. It refers back to the time of Noah and the flood and the wrath of God that came through the submersion into water. Are you able to withstand that? Are you able to walk through that? Jesus asked them. And they said, yes, Lord, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized as well. And he was pointing to the fact that one day they would experience what it means to carry the cross of Christ. That they would go to their death being a follower of Jesus and be martyred for their faith. And he goes on to say this, but to sit at the right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it was prepared. And when the ten heard it, that's the other disciples that were there, they began to be indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them to him and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be a slave to all. And Jesus uses the word deacon that we get from that to be a slave and to be a servant. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. So let's unpack this story for a moment. James and John sort of represent, they epitomize the way of the world. They epitomize the thinking that's in our world today about us and what we desire for ourselves. They they represent the selfishness, the selfish heart. And they're desiring that they would be able to have from Jesus power, position, prestige, success. This is the way the world operates. That's the way the world thinks, but it also comes into the church as well. And here are James and John, apostles, followers of Jesus, and they still have this mindset. The worldliness is so evident in the way they speak and what they ask of Jesus. And Jesus tells this story for us to see And Mark wants to use this story for us to understand what kind of people we should be. And he wants us to see clearly that we shouldn't have the attitude that James and John have in their heart. And the ambition that they have, the drive that they have for glory and power is contrasted with the way of Jesus, the way of the cross that he's going to unfold for everyone who was sitting there. And so the worldliness jumps out of the story. And it shows us the kind of world that we live in that's hungry for this kind of power and this kind of position. And we will do everything possible to have it. It's common to see people use their coworkers to get a better position in their job. My daughters are beginning to work and they're getting the opportunity to see what kind of work environment that they have and they're seeing people say things about others so that they would be able to get the position 
And so they've witnessed what it's like and how difficult it can be in the workplace because selfishness reigns there. Oh, it's common to use people to wiggle in with the in crowd. So you might form a relationship with someone because they might give you access to something that you don't have and that's the sole purpose for the relationship and how common it is for us to use people to get a better position in our community or whatever civic organization may we may, may be a part of. And it's common for the world to scheme, to find a better way to make their life better for themselves. Selfishness reigns in the world, and that's what was pouring out of the heart of James and John. And we see their self-centered demands contrasted with the type of life that Jesus says that we should follow after. John Calvin, when he was writing a commentary on this passage of scripture, said this, that their ambition was a bright mirror of human vanity. Isn't that beautiful? A bright mirror of human vanity. Remember, we've said that the word of God is like a mirror to, our, to us. And so as we read this story, we should allow it to expose our hearts. Do we have the ambition and the selfish desires that James and John have? Because it can be right here in God's church just as much as it is in the world. But Jesus said, not so for you. Not so for my people. And so the mind of Christ was far from James and John. Think about all the time, all the stories, all the things that they were able to see Jesus do, and here's what they want out of the first priorities. Give us the best place. And some have often said, that the disciples got mad at them because they wanted to be the first to ask it themselves. Because we have that ability to have this selfish ambition within our lives. And Jesus begins to tell us what kind of mind we're to have. And he had been relaying this to the disciples, but they still didn't get it. And we see this boldly here. Jesus would tell us that his ways are going to be opposite of the world. So different so radically opposed to the way of the world. This is what Jesus does when he comes into our heart. He makes us opposite of what the world is. Listen to Philippians chapter 2 where Paul tells you about the essence of what Jesus has done on the cross does to you. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. You see, that's the way of the cross. That's the way of following Jesus. That's what it should look like. And that's what he calls you and me to be like in this world. Especially those people who may use selfless service as a means to reach other people. It is that you have a deep need for others because of what Jesus has shown to you. What Jesus did was utterly selfless. And he put it on display for all the world to see. So John Stott said this, he emptied himself for glory. He humbled himself to serve. He never thought about himself or about his own honor. And he's referring to Jesus here. He gave himself without reserve to the needy and the neglectful. He risked his reputation by fraternizing with the dishonorable. His whole obsession was the glory of God and the good of human beings. And in order to promote those things, He was willing to go even to the shame and humiliation of the cross. Not honor, but dishonor. Not ambition, but sacrifice. Mark the life of Jesus, and he calls us to follow him. To look just like him. To sound like him. And through our hands and feet, to display him. So you can understand why the disciples were angry at James and John. They were indignant. They were ticked off with them. Because James and John wanted a throne. And that's often what's at the desire of our own heart. To reign and rule over others. To reign and rule especially our own life and not allow God to reign and rule over us. We want that throne and we fight for it. And that's what James and John were doing In this question that they asked of him, they didn't understand what it meant to be a servant. 
So Jesus took the opportunity to sit all the disciples down and give them another opportunity to hear what the kingdom of God was going to look like. And so he said this in verse 42 through 44, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. You see, that's the way of the world. That's what it looks like, that people, when they get power, they use it for their own purposes. And we can look at politicians. We can name them all around us often. You know the politicians that truly are servants, and you also know the politicians that are those that are there for themselves. And we can see it so easily. And Jesus uses a simple little example the way of the world is that you lord it over others. The way of the world is that you oppress others because of the power that you have. You don't serve them, you abuse them. And Jesus then says in verse 43, but it shall not be so among you. It should not be what any church is known for. A church shouldn't look like this. God's people shouldn't act this way. They shouldn't have this within their heart. And so we have to examine ourselves every time we hear God's word. Who do you look like in this picture and in this story? The disciples or Jesus? But whoever would be great among you must be your servants. And whoever would be first among you must be slave to all. See, that's what the kingdom of God looks like. That's what leadership will look like in God's church. We don't use people. We don't abuse people. We take care of the needs. We see them greater than ourselves and our own needs. And we become a servant. We care for them that we would take care of the needs that they may have. And we strive to find ways to do so because when we are doing that kind of action, we look most like Jesus to the world. And that's why it's so powerful when we serve in this kind of way. Because they're able to see something that they don't often see every day. And the world takes notice when somebody is humble and somebody is a servant. And I'm sure you could name some people that were in your workplace that you could say, I remember that person and how much they served our workplace, how much they served me. I'm sure you can name some people in your past that you can look at and see what they have done and what they've accomplished and you were amazed at how much of a servant they may be. And Jesus called us to serve others. And so whatever, whoever would be first among you must be a slave to all. Do you remember when Jesus was asked by one of the scribes? They were people who knew the word of God the best. They were the theologians who spent all the time scribing the Bible onto parchments and being able to teach it on to others. They would pass it orally and they would make sure that it was written down succinctly and perfectly and pass it along to others. And they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, what is the greatest of all the commandments? Sometimes they asked him that question to trap him, but this scribe asks him this, and this is the answer that Jesus gave. It's in Mark chapter 12, a little bit later on in Mark's gospel. He said, the most important is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second of these commandments that we need to understand is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And what Jesus did was summarize all of the laws that God had given. That encapsulated what they looked like. We're to love God and we're to love people and to serve them. And that's the kind of people he wants his church to be. That's how he's designed for you and I to live in this world and to show the world that Christ truly is within us. That's what selfless serving looks like. And it is so very powerful. In one of the churches I worked for, there was an elderly man who was a very powerful lawyer, probably one of the most powerful patent lawyers in the United States of America. 
And every week, he would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and drive to the church and open up the kitchen and begin to cook bacon and eggs, put out the cereal and the milk and all of these things for the 400-plus high school kids who would be coming in at 6.30 in the morning to eat and hear a gospel message. And because he cared for people and because he cared especially for students, he rarely missed a Thursday morning breakfast club. Everybody knew him, and he would serve with a smile, and then when it was all over, he'd help clean all the mess up, and then he'd get in his car and drive downtown to his office and do his work for the day. But because of his selfless serving that these kids saw, and knowing how powerful he was, they were amazed at why he would do such a thing. And so he began to invite people into his home because of the relationship that he made with these kids on Thursday morning. And he and his wife would host them in his house and they would come over and they would eat and they would just hang out and everyone would say, let's go to his house. His name was, his nickname was Coach K. And everybody wanted to go to K's house, Mr. K's house. And often on Friday nights, you'd find 20, 30 kids in his home. He, he didn't care if it was taken over by kids. And one kid that was there was horsing around in his living room and threw something at the window pane and shattered it. It was a large pane in the middle of his living room. And it was a Friday night when that happened. So you can imagine trying to get that repaired. And Mr. K took that young boy that had broken the window and said, it's okay, I can get a new one. And because of the selfless serving that Mr. K had, he impacted that kid's life who later came to Christ, mostly because of what Mr. K did in front of him. And he became a youth pastor. And today, that guy's over 65 years old today, and he's still a youth pastor because of Mr. K. And Mr. K died a few years ago, and countless hundreds of kids showed up at his funeral that are now adults with their own children because they remember this selfless, caring act of Mr. K. What an impact we can have by selfless serving. And it may enable us to reach even the hardest toward God because they see something in you that is so different from the world when you serve and you take care of those in need and you care for the homeless, you care for the addicted, you care for whatever the malady we might see in this world that you want to be a part of the solution instead of just pointing at the issue. You want to be somebody that we used by God to make a dent in some of the problems that we see in our culture and in our world. And so someone would go out into a field encampment for the homeless and begin to build a relationship with others and eventually lead them to Christ. Another would get up on Thursday morning at 3 in the morning to cook for 400 kids. That's a lot of bacon. It's a lot of eggs. But to do it joyfully because the love of Christ was in him and it flowed out into the lives of all the students that were impacted, that sat and watched. You see, the world is far from God, but the Lord will use you to draw them through your service, through the way you will live your life before them. And this is a faith-sharing position that you can have that the Lord has uniquely designed some of you to have and there's many sitting in this room today that I have seen your service I've seen what you've done the ways that you have helped with some of our partners at Mission Southside or City Union Mission all of the ways that you serve and you go and do that it is used by the Lord as he partners with you to reach those that are far from him you see, humble service is a surprise to the world. Christ-likeness is so opposite of way, the way the world looks. And so the best way we can serve this world is being more like Jesus and looking like him and being a servant for he said this in verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom 
for many. One of the most beautiful passages in the, in the Bible has been just read for us. You see, Jesus had all the power and the prestige and the position that you could ever imagine, but he willingly gave it all up so that you could have a relationship with God. He would come and die for you. He would come and take your place. He would take a lowly position that would be hanging on the cross. It was a great humiliation for God the Son to come and die for you and for your sin. And yet he did it in such a way that it changed the world. And these 12 apostles who once had selfish ambition began to be more like Jesus. And then their selfishness was eradicated by the power of the Spirit working in them. And they spent the rest of their lives serving people and sharing Christ with others so that the whole world would know who Jesus Christ is. And we sit today on the shoulders of the apostles, the 12 who were bold enough to continue on despite all of the trials and tribulations. And we sit here today on the backs of the apostles because Jesus Christ was their cornerstone. Oh, we've chosen the name of cornerstone on purpose for you and me to understand our role. To point the world to see Jesus who is the cornerstone and the foundation for everyone's life. And he surrendered his life to rescue the many. And he did that in you. And he calls you now to go and tell the story, to share it and do it through your hands and feet or, or maybe by building a friendship with somebody who needs one. You see, these are the ways the Lord can use us to share our faith and make it contagious with the world, to be infectious so that billions more will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. John Stott said this, the symbol of Christian leadership is not the purple robe of the emperor or the, it is the coarse apron of a slave. It's not a throne. It's a basin of water for the washing of feet. And the gospel tells us that that's what Jesus did. He got down on the ground and he took a towel and he wiped and washed the disciples' feet as an act of service so that you would see what the way of the kingdom. And so when you serve, wherever that may be, you're using water in a basin. And the Lord will use it in a powerful way and use you for that very purpose, to bring people who are far from the Lord to become near to him. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word reminds us today of the way of the kingdom and how different it is from the way of the world. And so, Father, we thank you that you've called us out of the darkness, out of the ways of the world, and you've brought us into your kingdom to be your people in this world for all to see Jesus in us. So we pray that your spirit would move us in such a way today that we would be bold and confident and as we go to be your missionaries, to be your harvesters, to be your witness, to be your ambassador, and to continue to tell the story of Jesus Christ before the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We want to look like you, Jesus. We want to be like you, Jesus. And if more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything, Lord. 
Because you are my life and my treasure The one that I can't live without So here at your feet My desires and dreams I lay down Oh, right here at your feet My desires and dreams I lay down of me take everything yes all of you is all I need take everything and if more of you means less of me take everything yes all of is all I need Take everything Oh Lord Change me like only you can Here with my heart in your hands Father I pray make me more Like Jesus This world dying to know who you are you've shown us the way to your heart so father i pray make me more like jesus oh lord come and change me like only you can here with my heart in your This world is dying to know who you are, and you've shown us the way to your heart. So, Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus, Lord. Oh, Lord, come and change me like only you. Here with my heart in your hands Father, I pray make me more like Jesus Cause this world is dying to know who you are You've shown us the way to your heart So Father, I pray make me more like Jesus, Lord, if more of you means less of me, take everything, because all of you is all I need, take everything. Now, as we depart together, we are reminded that God blesses us as we leave, as we go to be his people in this world. For we know that each and every day is a way to worship him. Each and every day is a way to serve Christ, to be more like him in the world. And God calls us to be a selfless servant, to be one who would take care of the needs and see the needs of others more important than even our own needs. So may the Lord use you. May the Lord enable you to care for others and to be more like Christ in the way that you care for others. And may he empower you as you go. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore until we see Christ again. So go and boldly proclaim Christ for all the world to hear. God bless and see you next week.